January 11, 2023. Um, item number eight, public information notices as required under notice bylaw 160-2022. The public has advised council's intention to adopt the following at its January 18th, 2022 meeting. Uh, not applicable at this time. Uh, blessing and land acknowledgement. Uh, Councillor Van Hoek. As we gather, we recognize that we are on Treaty 3 lands which are steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations and Métis people today. We continue to be thankful the part for the partnerships with Indigenous people. We give thanks for the many blessings we enjoy in the City of Kenora. We seek wisdom in our minds, clearness in our thinking, truth in our speaking, and always love in our hearts so that we may try always to unite the citizens of Kenora. Let these principles guide us in our decision making. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, moving on the agenda, uh, declaration of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof uh, uh, on today's agenda or from the meeting at which a member was not in attendance, uh, seeing none. Um, item number C, confirmation of previous committee uh, minutes and there's a motion on the floor. Uh, resolution number one, your worship, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Chase, that the minutes from the last regular committee of the whole meeting held December 5th, 2022, and the special committee of the whole meeting held December 29th, 2022, be confirmed as written and filed. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, call the vote. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on the agenda, uh, D, deputation. So we have, uh, we actually have three. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, in the first one, uh, we have a representative here, uh, Stephen, uh, and if, if I get the pronunciation wrong, I apologize, uh, Duraco. Uh, he's from Impact, or Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. And as you recall, this was uh, brought up with council. Um, this is actually part of our orientation and that. So we welcome Stephen, and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I appreciate Mayor and Council and staff Kenora to give me the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my name is Stephen Dorock, I did get the pronunciation right. And uh, I'm an account manager with Municipal and Stakeholder Relations at Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. My background, I was uh, actually spent many years in information technology. I worked at the Confederation College, moved over to Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. I've been there for 23, almost 24 years now. And, uh, but most recently about eight years in the Municipal and Stakeholder Relations Department. I do look forward to working with the uh, Council and Mayor and uh, also I do work regularly with uh, Kenora staff. Um, uh, anyway, uh, whether you're newly elected or a seasoned official, uh, my door is always open. Uh, I will have communication, uh, email and phone numbers uh, at the end of the, the presentation. Heather has uh, information on that as well. I also will be sending some updated presentations uh, that I couldn't include in this presentation. There are some videos, uh, links that I couldn't get to work. Uh, that will be um, updated uh, when I get back into Thunder Bay into my office. So to start off, uh, at AMPAC we are Ontario's property experts. Our job is to assess and classify more than 5.5 million properties uh, across Ontario with a combined worth of more than $3 trillion. In the past year, Ontario has grown by approximately 45,000 new residential homes. And in 2022, we added uh, $37 billion to Ontario's assessment rolls. Now, just for clarification, or just to narrow that down to, uh, to Kenora, we added $12 million to Kenora's assessment roll last year. And that's actually a, a very high number. So just so you know, we do have people out, uh, even during the pandemic, uh, we do have restrictions obviously, but still, uh, but we have people in the community. We have an office here in Kenora with uh, MPAC staff. Every municipality uses our assessments to make informed decisions about their community, including the distribution of property taxes. 
Ontario's property tax system uh, the, and these assessments generate approximately $30 billion in tax revenue annually. Next slide, please. There are four key players in Ontario's property assessment and taxation system. All have a different role and interest in this process. Sorry, can everyone see that? So I don't want to be in the way. So we'll start off with the provincial government and specifically the Ministry of Finance. They are responsible for setting assessment and taxation legislation as well as policies. They also determine the education property tax rate. Uh, there is also an independent body that adjudicates uh, appeals of impacts assessed values. That would be called the Assessment Review Board. They fall under the jurisdiction of the province, uh, Tribunals Ontario. MPAC is an independent, not-for-profit corporation funded by all Ontario municipalities. Our role is to accurately assess and classify <coughs> all properties in Ontario. We do this in compliance with the Assessment Act and regulations set by the Government of Ontario. Uh, we are accountable to the province, uh, municipalities, and property taxpayers of Ontario through a board of directors that is comprised of provincial, municipal, and taxpayer representatives, and these are all appointed by the Minister of Finance. Uh, municipalities determine their budget requirements, set tax rates, and collect property taxes to pay for municipal services such as police, fire, roads, recreation, water, among many other things. Uh, municipalities use MPAX assessments and the established tax rates to distribute their tax requirements to the ratepayers. And finally, the property owners, they pay the property tax bill and help set the market value through ongoing property purchases and sales. Next slide. So maintaining pro uh, Ontario's property database is very important to us. Uh, property data is continuously updated. Uh, so that municipal records are accurate when our municipal stakeholders are making important tax decisions. Maintaining on Ontario's property database includes inspecting and assessing new construction, additions and reno renovations in a timely manner, responding to property owner inquiries, and working to help them understand their assessments. Uh, we support municipality through our ongoing support, uh, through me, the account manager, and the uh, and other staff that work uh, alongside me. Uh, we offer Municipal Connect, that's our application portal, uh, portal that municipal staff use uh, they could, so to obtain the primary source of assessment related information. Uh, we work collaboratively also uh, on projects that are important to municipalities like digital billing permit and digital plan submissions. Uh, these projects are also presented to what we have, we have a municipal liaison group that works closely with uh, my department and they meet monthly. Uh, to represent the district of Kenora, we have someone in Sioux Lookout, and in Rainy River, we have someone from Atacokan. We do have uh, important statutory duties, uh, such as handling requests for reconsideration and maintaining people data as well, uh, by tracking school supports for over 5.5 million properties. Uh, next slide. <coughs> so monitoring the, uh, uh, the market and uh, Assessing newly built and renovated properties are things that we do every day to keep our property to current. We also periodically update every single assessment in Ontario uh, uh, based on uh, a legislated valuation date. I'll get into more of that later. We call this uh, an assessment update or a reassessment. The, va the valuation date uh, for the most recent assessment update took, that took place in 2017 uh, that assessment date is January 1st, 2016. So this is when we determined what every single property in Ontario could have sold for, or reasonably sold for, in its current state and condition at a particular time. And that time is January 1st, 2016. So regular, uh, regular revaluation of properties ensures that uh, assessments stay up to date and similar properties of similar value in the same municipality pay similar uh, taxes. Provincial legislation determines when MPAC conducts each province-wide assessment update and sets the valuation date for each update cycle. Uh, next slide, please. So the reassessment that was scheduled to occur in, in 2020 uh, was postponed by the province, and I'll use their words, it was to provide stability and certainty to Ontarians 
and to enable municipalities to focus on responding to the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. That was the Minister of Finance and Dunford. As a result, property assessments continue to be based on the legislative value of January 1st, 2016. This should not have a negative financial impact on municipalities as AMPAC continues to maintain and update assessment, uh, the assessment role to reflect changes such as new construction and improvements to property. However, so uh, your question will probably be, if I built a new property, um, how would it be assessed? And we would say, well, what would that sell for? On January 1st, 2016, even a new building built here today, whether it's commercial, industrial, or residential. Until we get that new valuation date, that's what it'll be based on. Uh, next slide. Ontario's property tax system is based on everyone paying their portion of what it costs to deliver community services. To do this, all properties are assigned a value uh, at a common valuation date, as noted in the prior slide. Uh, this principle is called Current Value Assessment, or CVA. This, uh, this is the price a property <coughs> might reasonably be ex expected to sell for if sold by a willing seller to a willing buyer after appropriate time and exposure on an open market. Uh, we collect, we do a, a rigorous sales analysis for uh, every property that is sold. There's probably over 24 codes um, for different sales, different types of sales. So uh, next slide please. So talking about the assessment update, just to reiterate, MPAC uh, awaits news from the provincial government, the Minister of Finance, about the next province-wide assessment update. Uh, so January 1st, 2016 does continue to be our tariffs legislative evaluation date. As noted earlier, uh, this is a fixed date uh, to which all properties are valued. Although uh, the assessment <coughs> date remains paused, our work continues to keep property assessment uh, data up to date. Property owners will still receive notices uh, from MPAC if there are changes to their properties. In November, for example, MPAC sent out yeah, 800,000 notices to reflect changes in properties. Once the, provin uh, the province announces when the next assessment date will take <coughs> place and what the valuation date will be, we will let you know. We can then work to have meaningful conversations as we work to finalize assess values within your community. Next slide. So this is just an example of what the assessment cycle looks like. Uh, this slide explains what happens when there is an assessment update call. It shows the link between a chosen valuation date, the mailing of impact property assessment notices, and the phase-in, which is bringing the new assessed value of a property into effect over a period of time. The phase-in program was introduced uh, by the province to provide an additional level of property tax stability and predictability. When properties experience a market increase, the assessed value uh, is phased in over a period of four years. Uh, any assessment decreases are realized in year one of the assessment update. Next slide. We're talking about valuation now. Um, there are five major factors to valuation. So when we're looking at the valuation of a residential home, for example, although uh, our analysis tool considers over 200 factors, uh, and data points, the above five make up the approximately 85% of a typical home's value. So these include location, lot dimensions, uh, exterior square footage, quality of construction, and the age of the property. Now the age of the property does get adjusted for any major uh, renovations that have occurred. We call this effective age. After. Next slide. So in Ontario, there are three industry-wide standardized approaches to valuing properties. The first of these approaches is the direct comparison approach. And this valuation approach is used primarily for residential properties, condos, and vacant land. Uh, with this approach, we analyze recent sales of comparable properties that are sold for a similar or identical use as the property to be valued to provide an indication of value. It's also important uh, that only valid open market transactions are used in this analysis. 
Next slide. Next, we're going to talk about the income approach. The income approach is used for uh, large uh, medical or dental buildings, office buildings, shopping centers, large sports stadiums, and industrial malls. Uh, in income producing properties, the ability to earn revenue is directly tied to its current value. Uh, to be clear, uh, we determine how much revenue it could generate as well as the sale price. So it's not just, it's not the actual revenue being generated by the occupant, but rather the rent that the occupant is paying to the landlord that we use to value properties using the income approach. Uh, this method requires a detailed analysis <coughs> of income expenses, both for the property being valued and other similar properties. So we do rely on the input of property owners who own these large buildings to fill out what we call a peer report. Um, and that, that way we can continue with the valuation, a more accurate valuation. Uh, these two factors create a capitalization rate, or what's better known as the cap rate, that helps, uh, determine, helps us determine the property's assessed value. So lastly, we have, oh sorry, next, next slide. Uh, lastly, we have the cost approach. A cost approach is typically used for the general purpose um, industrial properties, small uh, retail, gravel pits, warehousing, uh, paper mills, pulp mills, and mines. Uh, this approach is used when a property type is unique and rarely sold on the open market as we cannot rely on either a direct comparison or the income approaches to come up with a value. It's just about lack of data pretty much. So we first calculate the cost of replacing buildings, structures, or other accessible fixtures on the land. Uh, <clears throat> Then we apply a reduction for depreciation on all structures due to age, as well as any functional or economic adjustment. If there are conditions impacting the value of that property, so these are also known as functional obsolescence or economic obsolescence. Finally, we determine the value of the land, add it to the building calculations to produce an overall valuation. Uh, next slide. So what draws our attention to a property it is uh, typically one of the following things. It's a market sale, a request from a municipality or a property owner, a building permit, a building permit activity, uh, or a request for reconsideration or an appeal. MPAC's role is to take building permits and plans and turn them into assessment. Our municipal stakeholders rely on MPAC assessments to deliver property tax. The sooner MPAC can deliver an assessment, the sooner our municipal and stakeholder relations, uh, stakeholders sorry, can realize new revenue. So it's important that we have a good relationship with a building department, for example. Uh, the sooner we get you know, uh, permits into our system, and the sooner we get to view plans, uh, the faster we can actually get that assessment added to the role, which, is be which benefits uh, everyone in the equation. Uh, our, uh, yeah, so every year MPAC processes an average of 300,000 building permits uh, for new development or renovations. In fact, we actually, MPAC is the only organization with a data set of all building permits in Ontario. Our understanding of this data gives us a unique perspective on ways to modernize its collection in exchange uh, to support our municipal partners. So uh, just some insights based on some of the data we've captured. Uh, in 2021, Ontario saw more than 48,000 new residential homes uh, constructed with just under 50% being detached homes. Uh, condos are getting smaller, but detached homes are getting bigger. Ontario condominiums are 35% smaller on average than they were 25 years ago, while the average detached home is 25% larger. In the 90s, the average condo in Ontario peaked at approximately 1,100 square feet. Yeah, the most recent impact data shows that condo, uh, the average condo today is about 700 square feet. Uh, in comparison to single family detached homes, uh, home was approximately 2,000 square feet in the 90s, and now a, typically, a typical single family home is around 2,500 square feet. Next slide, please. <coughs> so after we, uh, after we assess a property or a change in assessment, we mail the property owner a property assessment notice. 
Sometimes property owners do not agree with their assessed value. And so a property owner might uh, connect with a council member or, um, or, a, or a municipal staff. Um, in that case, what we, I think the important direction is to direct the property owner to aboutmyproperty.ca. It has a wealth of information about it, uh, about their property and other comparable properties. But I think it's also important that, that uh, a property owner asks themselves one of these, one of the four questions, or actually all of these. Um, number one, could they have sold their property on January 1st, 2016 for that assessed value? Uh, number two, have they visited about my property to review the information that PAC has on file regarding their property to ensure it's correct? Sometimes it's, a, it's just a, as easy as having the wrong square footage or having certain structures that aren't there anymore updated. Uh, number three, uh, have they used about my property to conduct a comparable research on assessment values in their area? It's very easy. They can actually click on comparable properties in their neighborhood or close to them to see what their actual sale value was without getting too much personal information involved, obviously. We do follow in federal rules. And number four, if a property owner still disagrees with their assessment, they have the option to file their request for reconsideration. And we will review it free of charge. There is also the ability to file an appeal with the assessment review board, but a property owner, a residential property owner, must go through the Agbar process first in order to get to the appeals appeal process. So the fastest way to start a review is by filing an RFR on about my property, you can do it through our website, or we actually can go to impact.ca and do that. And there is also other contact information on impact.ca. You don't have to do it through the web, you can actually give us our call center a call. Next slide, please. Just wanna uh, spend a moment to address the relationship between uh, property taxes and assessment. Assessments distribute taxes, they do not determine taxes paid. Uh, when a province-wide assessment uh, update does occur, the most important factor is not how much the assessed value of a property has changed, but rather how the assessed value has changed relative to the average change in class in that community. So this concept is explained in a recent toolkit that we did share with municipalities. Um, next slide, please. And just more on that, in anticipation of the next province-wide assessment update, <coughs> uh, we have implemented a strategy uh, to address misconceptions about the relationships between assessed value and the taxation. So this includes resources for municipalities that will ensure when an announcement is made, we're ready to support you. Uh, there's a digital toolkit available at impact.ca. Uh, uh, municipalities uh, can go to, including uh, elected officials, to mitigate uh, misinformation to provide and to provide support and resources to educate and inform property owners. Uh, this digital toolkit uh, there's all includes this video which I couldn't play today. I wish I could. It's, it's this one right here, but um, that is on our website. And like I said, I'll be sending an updated uh, link to that and many other videos. We actually have our own YouTube page where there's these very short and simple videos explaining taxation and assessment. Uh, okay. The next slide, please. I hope it didn't go too quickly. I appreciate having me here today. Uh, if you want to stay connected, uh, my, like I said, on the next slide, or the next couple slides, sorry, the last slide, we will have, oh, this video is here. <laughs> this is, uh, you might be able to click on it. I'm not sure if that'll work. Uh, what if a browser was up today? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'm thinking not. Let me just see if I can. No. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. Didn't you see this one? I don't know. Like I said, we do have we have an entire YouTube channel full of videos. And while Heather tries to get that to work, I just want to say um, I just appreciate you having me here today. Uh, Reach out to me uh, at any time if you have any questions or looking for any of these other resources.
Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, so I'm, I'm going to allow council to, because I'm sure there's questions that uh, want to be asked. So um, I'll, I'll open it up and I'll, I'll start over here with uh, Councilor Chase. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, hi, Stephen. Thank you for your presentation. Just a couple of really quick questions. Um, when, using square footage as one of your uh, measurements for value, does that also include developed uh, square footage that's below grade? Like how do you, when you're analyzing an exterior measure of a property and getting square footage, um, how do you know if it's got a finished basement, for example, or not? And is that factored into, re into your evaluation? It is. A finished basement is, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, carry the same weight as the main floor or a seven floor, for example, but finished basements are part of the calculation. Yes, they are. Okay. It also depends on, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but it depends on the type of building, if it's commercial, industrial, or, uh, or residential. So, so in like a single family detached residential home that's built slab on grade, how do you know if it has a basement or not? Do we you have look, do you look We would have inspected it. Okay. Yeah, so uh, every building permit, when we have a building permit, it does trigger an inspection. Okay. So, um, when our inspector goes there, we, we, we don't just measure, we'll get in and, and also if we can't get the plans, it's, it's kind of hard to get the plans, but a lot of, a lot of modern plans now are in digital format, yeah. so that also gives us a heads up. Okay. Uh, but we, we try to, we will, we have to get to a new property. Okay. Is, and then one other quick question if I may, thank you. Um, how do you know or define when you say like a sale is open market? Um, when, it, when something is transacted and you see it trade in land titles, for example, how or do you search MLS? Do you search real estate board? Do you yeah. try to find out from local realtors? Well, we, I'm just curious because, yeah. I, and in full disclosure, I'm a realtor. So yeah. I, I know when things transact privately, they still show up as a sale in land titles. And if you don't know how it transacted, I'm just curious how you know if it's open market. Sure, well, we do contact the property owner. <clears throat> okay. we, uh, we have what we call, we do a sales investigation. Okay. So each, each sale is investigated by a property inspector or um, a valuation uh, expert. So we have, like I said, we have many codes for a sale. Okay. Like we have, to, we have to put that code on. Yeah. We have to get that information. So we're mandated to collect all that information. And then we decide, is that a forced sale, uh, you know, or a state sale? But we do have a lot of codes to, to represent that. Okay. And, and, and that's very important for our analysis, right? So we wouldn't take a $2 sale or, or chattels, depending on what chattels were included yeah. in, in the sale. But we do have a questionnaire and we do contact the property owner to see what transacted. Okay, thank you, Thelor. Those were my questions. Uh, Councilor Thank you, Your Worship. Um, is there any communication around a time frame for the new valuation date? <laughs> I know that's not your direction, but I'm wondering if you have it. Well, that's super tricky. Uh, you know, we, I was hoping to actually announce that uh, on this, this set of uh, presentations that I'm doing throughout Northwest Ontario, but we don't have that yet. So uh, I thought they might have announced it uh, back in <coughs> fall, they had the fall economic statement. I was sort of waiting for it then. Uh, but we're sort of still waiting for the Ministry of Finance and, um, and the government to announce when that's going to be. We have no clue. So. It is trickier on our end because we do prepare for it. Mm -hmm. We prepare for multiple valuation dates. We have uh, two modelers, statisticians in Thunder Bay who are constantly uh, drawing up different models based on the sales and, you know, waterfront model, uh, residential model, uh, commercial models, uh, land models, just all, they all have to be calculated based on different valuation dates and what set of sales we're going to include, right? So we have, now we have a very large uh, a database of sales and years of sales, so hopefully that will make our assessments even better, right? Because sales is key to making that analysis. But I really wish I, I had more information on that that I could share. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we're looking at 2024 for a, uh, a delivery of the new assessment. Uh, and the valuation date may be uh, January 1st, 2023 or January 1st, 2022. But I, I can't say for sure. I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think that's fair for me to, to speculate. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Councillor Moncrief, do you have any questions? No? Okay. <coughs> um, 
Councilor Manson? No. Thank you. No. Uh, I have one question. So, um, if we're going back to January 1st, uh, 16, uh, was the last, or 2016, um, does that mean we're basically looking at two cycles by the time we get to, like, uh, to, to the end of 2022? That would be eight years? It's a long time, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the pandemic really, really put things, uh, set things back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, the good news is we were collecting data. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have a lot of those years throughout those assessment cycles, or this one is giant assessment cycle. Uh, so everything, the good news is everything's phased in. Mm -hmm. It gave us time to catch up on appeals as well, because there was an appeal backlog with uh, Tribunals Ontario, the Assessment Review Board. So that's also good news. Uh, but yes, it is uh, all roughly, you know, you're looking at about almost two full assessment cycles worth of, worth of time. So, yeah. You know. um, and my other question or point, I guess, um, it's almost like the perfect storm because, uh, you know, with inflation, obviously municipality costs are just, they're skyrocketing in all kinds of different areas um, out of our control. And then we're going to have this huge increase in assessment, unless the market goes the other way. But I'm assuming right now it looks like it's gone up considerably. Um, that's the perfect storm for people banging our door down here, uh, complaining about increased taxes, because there's always winners and losers when assessment um, goes up, yeah. you know, when you do your calculations. Um, that could be, I, I, I'm just wondering if that's going to be problematic right across the province. Well, not just isolated to Kenora, but right across Ontario. For sure. And, and that's why I did mention we, have, we, are, we do have a strategy uh, to mitigate any sort of misinformation that is out there because, uh, you know, uh, and this is for, for all of Ontarians. This is not just for uh, admin staff or mayor council. We, we're going to try and outreach, do an outreach for... Uh, all, all people in Ontario, uh, whether it be print or news or social media, it's important for uh, everyone to understand that uh, just because your assessment is going up, it doesn't mean your taxes are going to, going to go up. And I think that's a very important message. Uh, as long as, you know, when taxes, when, when assessments go up altogether, it's basically you're still going to be paying whatever the municipality needs to fulfill their budget. Right, so it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that your, your taxes are going to go up just because your assessment went up. So, and you're right that it, it does pose a challenge uh, with you know uh, with all the latest data that we've had over the last few years and sales going up. Right, so I, I understand your concern, and hopefully um, our new strategy will address that. But we do want to educate all Ontarians, and that's why you know you don't want to see an influx of people coming here complaining about their assessments, right? So we'll have it on abovemyproperty.ca, we'll have uh, social media, print media, and I, I'm not too sure where you are on pamphlets. We did have at one time, we did have pamphlets available in every municipality uh, for different property types. And I will, I, I told Red Lake this the other night, um, but I will check back with um, uh, MPAC on what sort of information, resources we have that we can keep at the local municipality level. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and no other questions then? So, well, thank you very much, Stephen, for uh, attending this morning. And, uh, lots of valuable information there. Yeah, and, and if anyone else has any uh, feedback or questions, just email me directly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on the agenda, our, our next uh, deputation is uh, uh, Dave Swartz. And he's going to uh, talk about Old Miller Rapids Road and the urban trail system. So, welcome, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and Happy New Year, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I always like about uh, coming to council, and I've been here a few times before, is the nice congenial atmosphere in the place. Uh, no personal attacks, no uh, no diatribe. It's it's really fun. Anyway, uh, to all the new councillors, uh, congratulations. 
and Mr. Mayor as well, uh, congratulations on your recent election and uh, I wish you every success. And I also thank you for your willingness to uh, devote a lot of time and energy and talent to, uh, to your role. Uh, anyway, my, na my name is Dave Schwartz. I'm a youth physics teacher. Um, uh, my, some of my other roles are uh, general license at large and uh, <laughs> uh, pursuer of lost causes. <laughs> uh, in terms of other roles that I've filled, uh, I'm a uh, member of the uh, well, a previous member of the previous Environmental Commission, or uh, committee actually, and uh, and the Trails Committee as well. Uh, and a lot of my efforts recently have have centered around trying to make uh, Kenora a better place to live. Anyway, uh, my purpose here today is to highlight what I see is a very time-sensitive opportunity. Um, as you all know, uh, Kenora Urban Trail System, uh, which had its start about 20 years ago through, uh, through health concerns, uh, the original purpose of the trails was to develop opportunities for people to get out and walk and get healthier because the uh, general health of the population was deemed at the time to be, yeah, in short, abysmal. Uh, anyway, uh, the trail system has dramatically improved life in Kenora. Uh, no small thanks to Councillor Manson who had a, a key role in all of that and was a driving force behind the, uh, the development of the trails. Um, anyway, um, the o Old Miller Rapids Road would be an excellent addition to our present urban trails network and would serve an area of the city uh, which is slated for commercial and residential growth. Uh, I'm used to pointing this stuff uh, in my previous career, pointing <laughs> stuff with a meter stick, which also helped to uh, <laughs> make sure my attendees were atten attending or attentive. Uh, incorporating the old Bell Rapids Road into the urban trail system would facilitate immediate links, links to the present trail network, and there'd be a long-term potential for further connections. I wouldn't see this happening anytime soon. The immediate connection, the immediate concern is this, and securing its future in the trails network. In the long term, there'd be a potential for a pedestrian bridge across to Old Fort Island and another bridge over to connect to the Turtle Island. That, that would be a long-term dream. A fair bit of money involved in that. But uh, interestingly, the uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan uh, indicates extremely strong public support for the Trails Network and the willingness of the public to see more money spent on parks and trails. The um, Parks and Recreation Plan also recommends expanding the present trails network. Okay, securing this part of the trail would open the, op open the opportunity to connect to the Rabbit Lake trails um, and potential future trails through this property out over toward McLeod Park. And it was also a very easy connection to the trails that went uh, through the streets. Um, <coughs> uh, next slide, please. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, that's just a different look at the at the uh, at the area. Exactly the same issues. Um, okay, we can leave that up. Um, you want the other one back up? Doesn't matter. Okay. It's all good. Uh, the proposed trail has some really positive features. Number one, it's already there. Don't need to do anything. Uh, maybe a little uh, surface improvement. Uh, some signage. There's 900 meters of beautiful riverside scenery. The flat topography is wheelchair accessible for the entire length. Tree canopy, something that's mentioned in the uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan is that Kenora is very lacking in tree canopy. The trail already has it. Uh, along virtually the entire length. Uh, this trail would fill a gap in an area where there are no formal trails and very little in the way of parks. Uh, it's bikeable. In fact, it's actually part of the present uh, bike trails network. Not too many people know that, but it's on the bike routes maps. And uh, as a bonus feature, there's potential for parking at either end. There is already parking up here and uh, some parking down here. Uh, this section of the trail should be easy to secure. Uh, it's very tight between the uh, Veterans Drive and the, and the water, so there's not much room to do anything else with it. Park possibilities, the uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan indicates a shortage of neighborhood parks in Kenora. Uh, we have about half the recommended amount of neighborhood parks that's generally recommended. Uh, there would be an opportunity. Maybe, uh, would you go back to the previous slide, please? Uh, There's a potential park site here. And there's a little bit of potential for it. There's a little spot there that would make a wonderful pocket park. Anyway, that's all good. But there's a fly in the ointment. Uh, the property is all privately owned. And uh, again, in the, in the master plan, Parks and Recreation Master Plan. It addresses that, and there, the ideal solution, of course, would br to bring the appropriate property into the into the public domain. And uh, according to the master plan, that can be achieved through land dedication, direct purchase by the city, land swaps, donations, and gifts. Uh, and note once again that the public opinion does support the increased spending on parks. And then a backup plan. If acquisition of the property were to fail, uh, securing the rights of public access to that trail section would be the logical backup plan. Anyway. Solving that all is above my pay grade. <laughs> so I'll leave that in your capable hands. Uh, one thing I would recommend is that discussion related to the trails and park opportunities should be initiated with the property owners as soon as possible. Get that going because it's an opportunity that I think it's a wonderful opportunity but if we lose it now, it's probably gone forever. 
Anyway, going back to the uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan, its goal is to optimize places, spaces, and services. And pulling this off would definitely be a step in the right direction. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm open to questions. Questions of council? I've, oh, Lee? there were more pictures. Do you want more pictures? <laughs> now, as you can see, it's a beautiful setting. The tree canopy is there. The, the old road bed is chip seal, which is gradually falling apart. Uh, could be touched up. Um, same trail in winter. Uh, <coughs> gotta be the most beautiful site in the universe for a sewage treatment plant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next is uh, another, another shot of the river. And, uh, another shot. And bridges, we all love them. People really like bridges over water. And they'll go stand on them and block, and really enjoy them. So that's part of what I would see as a long-term dream. And another bridge. Other countries do them. Other communities do them. And it's just a wonderful place to go and observe nature. So uh, photograph for the sake of a photograph. I don't know. Okay, this time I'm done. Thank you. So, no questions then? Uh, oh, sorry. Councilor Matthews? Just a comment. Thanks, Dave, for continuing to promote uh, trail development and uh, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Moncrief, do you have any questions? No? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. And uh, I enjoyed our, um, I think it was myself and Stace that went with you back in November before the storm, <laughs> uh, yeah. or in October, um, and it was, I, I mean, I, I didn't realize that was there, I mean, it was this hidden gem, so uh, it, it, it's amazing, and the, and the wildlife there, and the, like the trees, and the, just the, the river as its background, and that, it was, uh, it was actually amazing, uh, I'm, a, I'm a rotary trail person, that's as far as I go, so um, it, it, was, uh, it was nice to, uh, it was nice to see that, and I appreciate that uh, opportunity to walk that with you, and we'll leave it with us, and we'll see what yeah. we can do here. Yeah, I, I appreciated uh, the fact that uh, several of you were able to make it out, and uh, you it first hand. Barb, I know you'd be familiar I've with the name. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on the deputations and that, we have uh, Jill Hager. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. Um, myself, I've also presented before council before and I have to echo uh, Mr. Schwartz's statements about the, the atmosphere. Um, I do appreciate Council's uh, accommodating me today. I understand Heather informed me that some of the processes have changed recently, so I do appreciate you kind of uh, tagging me as an add-on. So um, I guess I'll just sort of dive into it. Um, I just want to come and talk about some of the uh, concerns around the public skating uh, in the community of Kenora, specifically the cancellation of the public skate in Kewain. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Kenora. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I have two school-aged children, age four and six. And for as long as I can remember, there's been a public skate available in Kuwait on Wednesday nights from 6 to 7.30, which was always, in my experience, very well attended. Um, I attended this skate regularly with my eldest child when I learned uh, taught her how to skate independently myself. It was good physical exercise and a social outing uh, in the dead of winter for our family. We would go as a whole, sometimes you know, aunts and uncles and grandparents would tag along. Um, flash forward to this ice season, and there are no regularly scheduled public skates available for families of school age children to attend. Um, I do have a, the schedule here, but I'll get to that later. Um, so as a result, I and other families lack opportunities to teach our own children how to skate. Personally, I have resorted to enrolling my youngest child, age four, um, in the Skating Academy and Can Skate programs, which come with a significant cost. So it's approximately $124 for 10 weeks of half hour lessons plus taxes and a one-time $50 administration fee, so we're looking at close to $190. Um, 
I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford the cost so my child can learn to skate and participate in a leisure activity, albeit separately from the rest of our family and for only a short duration of time. I have encountered numerous other community members who regularly attended that Kuwait public skate that are upset that the city chose, uh, has chosen to eliminate the weekday evening public skating option. Um, in reviewing the online arena schedules for the remainder of the 2022-2023 season, it's evident that that ice time, um, the 6 to 7.30 time slot in Kuwaitan, has been absorbed by minor hockey programs, organized minor hockey programs. So currently this is the flyer that I picked up at the rec center uh, on Monday. So there is public skating from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays, again, and then Fridays at 1 to 2.30. School-aged children cannot attend these. Um, there's a Sunday public skate from 12 to 3. However, it does note that subjects, you know, subject to change without notice, of course. Um, so I took a look online at the arena schedule for the remainder of the ice from this year, from January 1st to ice out. Um, there's only th actually three public skates, so I think it's a bit of a disservice to our community to say that we have a scheduled public skate when we in fact don't. Um, those are on February 26th, March 5th, and March 19th. The remaining 12 Sundays between January and ice out are cancelled due to youth tournaments, adult tournaments, and other special events. Um, which, again, so these skates are not accessible to the Tuesday, Thursday, not accessible to school aged children. In addition, the Tourism Kenora campaign highlights the arenas and skating as a destination, and it even lists the Kuwait public skate as a destination, but there absolutely is no option for a skate in Kuwait. And as a visitor to this community, I do feel there is a lack of actual skating options if that's what we're advertising as a tourist community. Um, transportation in our, in our community is a known barrier. There is in fact no bus services on Sundays for those lacking transportation to attend a public skate at the Kenora Arena on a Sunday. Um, there's also access to neighborhood rinks is important. Over the years we have a community has lost, lost an outdoor rink in Norman. What was once JM Central is under construction and I noted that they don't have a ice surface under the white cap this season which I mean obviously it's been a poor season for making ice which is a whole nother <laughs> issue with the outdoor ice. So this leaves Evergreen and Rideout, um, Rideout of which is used three evenings a week for local adult broomball leagues so that does limit uh, accessibility for school age kids to use it and on these ice surfaces it's been my experience that it's predominantly taken up by hockey making it near impossible for a beginner or others to enjoy skating without actually just participating in hockey. And like, I do love playing hockey myself, but <laughs> I just, this is outside of that. As much as I love hockey, it's like, we're not just hockey. Um, so anyway, <laughs> irregular uh, skating, uh, the, the irregular Sunday public skating is not equitable or accessible. Families are out taking advantage of what our community has to offer um, and spending time as a family. We do have lots of other, you know, there's special events and different things going on and it's sort of smack dab in the middle of the day. Um, my family did attend some of the Sunday skates in the fall, but we found that quite frequently it was cut short or canceled at short notice and we were having to call every time just to confirm that it was in fact happening. So we couldn't really plan to have it, you know, then it's like, okay, what's our backup plan? Um, the Kuwait public skate was affordable for families and was offered in a safe and controlled environment compared to the outdoor rinks. The ice quality is there, there's, you know, it's just safer, it's, it's warmer, it's, there's so many different factors. And I think it, it needs to be noted that this city is more than just hockey. I feel like there's such a focus on the hockey, but we are more than that. And there needs to be other recre recreational opportunities need to reflect that. Um, Mr. Schwartz spoke of the uh, Parks and Recreation Plan, and I'm going to highlight some of the things that um, I wanted to draw attention to around the arenas. Um, so there were three guiding principles in the, the master plan that stood out to me, and that was the equity and inclusion, accessibility and affordability. So cancelling the weekday public skate time goes against each of those three principles. We received information from the city staff advising that weekday ice demands from user groups or from youth groups has increased, um, with hockey being the the main consumer. Um, however, the master plan indicates that participation in boys minor hockey is on a slight decline, and there's only a slight increase in girls programming. So I would presume that would be a net zero of uh, increase in use. Um, ice hockey is a significant financial barrier sport, whereas public skating is a far more affordable and accessible activity for a broader portion of our community population. I have frequently arrived at the arena for a 9 to 10 p.m. ice time to find the arena empty or not in use for the 8 to 9 p.m. time slot, um, or very minimally used, having only like five or six youth on the ice with no coach or anything. 
Um, priority of ice time continues to be provided to long-standing private user groups to the detriment of the general public. The city needs to provide direction to ice user groups to encourage efficiencies in the use of ice time. I would call for a review and revamp of the ice allocation policy to better align with the goals of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. As outlined in the Master Plan, youth activities, this is a direct quote from it, youth activity preferences have been shifting over time towards individual pursuits and unstructured sporting activities. Municipalities have been focusing on providing expanded drop-in activities to better accommodate youth and adults that lack interest or ability to participate in organized or competitive leagues. The current allocation of ice time and cancellation of public skating does not reflect these statements in the master plan document. There have been re very recent and sometimes heated discussions in our community around mental health, substance misuse, and the related safety concerns in our community. There needs to be some concerted efforts to address the social detriments of health as a community. We need to start putting in, some, putting in place some upstream measures, so to speak, um, in an effort to prevent some of these issues before they spiral into a greater community issue. There needs to be support for accessible, lower cost, safe, reliable recreational opportunities for the families and youth in our community. So in my opinion, our city should be enhancing positive recreational leisure opportunities, not eliminating them, such as this, the public skate. Um, and I guess my final remark is like this council was voted in on the commitment to improve our community for the young working families that continue to choose and live here and make Kenora their home and eliminating the weekday evening skate does not align with that and it does not align with the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Um, specifically those and like specifically those in the neighborhood of Kiwayton. Um, so I guess my ask to this council is to immediately reinstate the Wednesday evening public skates at the Kiwayton Arena. And then I have a long-term ask to see a redevelopment of the ice allocation policies. Sorry, Stace, I know you've <laughs> heard me bang this drum before. <laughs> got you last time. <laughs> <laughs> um, to see a redevelopment of the ice allocation policies, procedures, and costing to better align with the information goals and guiding principles outlined in the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, and in conjunction to see city-led development of administrative practices to promote efficiencies within the various ice user groups in order to maximize the limited resources and recreational resources that we have for all of our users, not just hockey. Thank you. That was Thank helpful. You. Um, so I'm going to open it up to some questions, but uh, first, if, if you can ensure that we get a copy yeah, of that, I'll or it to, to the Thank city clerk, yeah. then? Okay, for thanks. Sure. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Uh, oh, uh, Councillor Moncrief. Go ahead. Oh. Oh. We were working, so she oh. was fine. Mm. Is she on mute? No. Yeah, she's on mute. Uh, and we and we <laughs> tested this earlier too, and it worked fine. So it's not on my end. Can you type it in? Can't hear you. Yeah, I can try. It. She's. Can you type it in, Councillor Moncrief? And I'll pull up your, the chat. Ask her to try again because it almost sounded like we could hear her. Well, yeah, we did and we before. heard her earlier. earlier. She just we tested minute. it. The last few words she said, I thought we heard. She said skip. Um, <laughs> Councillor Moncrief, if you want to send me an email, I can read it out for you. If you want to send it in email. I can get her on FaceTime audio and play it in the microphone. Sure. Good. <laughs> Good oh, there we go. Yeah, we can hear you. I'll put it through my mic here. Go ahead. Okay, hi Jill. I just wanted to say thanks for coming and I appreciate you speaking on behalf of people who have financial barriers to access recreation. Um, and independent, unstructured recreation is the trend. And us pay, paying for studies, purchasing studies that sit on a shelf and aren't used to actually 
uh, direct how we do business is unfortunate. So I would hope that uh, in planning, the staff take those studies into account. My question is more maybe for Stace, how far in advance are these schedules made and is there any flexibility? Lisa, if I could, Councillor Moncrief, I apologize. Um, Stace is no longer in charge of the recreation area. Um, we have a new general manager that started and I would like to have a conversation with them and could we maybe come back and, and provide some more information on that at a subsequent meeting because some of the things that um, Jill has spoke to today are currently underway. And so I would like to just take the time to go back. This is the first that I've learned of this issue. So I'd like to just take this away and, and if we could come back in February, I'd appreciate the opportunity. Sure, that's great. And I, if that satisfies Jill, I, I know Sunday I was at the arena and I saw people come in with skates for public skating when there was a hockey tournament on. So it is, hap it is happening. Thank, th th thanks, Councillor Moncrief. Um, any other questions of Council uh, Councillor Manson? I just want to say I grew up in West Bay Q8 <laughs> in a very uh, poor neighborhood, I would say. And the only thing we had to do mm -hmm. was go to the rink for a fee that our family could afford. So I commend you for coming to Council and letting us know about this. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, uh, thanks for the yeah. information, Jill. I, I think a lot of us were surprised. I was yeah. uh, when I heard that. Yeah. So um, we'll leave it with us. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you, have a, you have a second calling if need be. Solving so. problems. <laughs> yeah. um, so moving on the agenda under item number one, administration, we have uh, several reports. Uh, the first one is 1.1, 1 .1, it's uh, the 20, 2023 conference attendance. Um, Heather, would you like to speak to that? Or? Sure, I can uh, <clears throat> lead the discussion. This report is an opportunity to allow council to have a wholesome discussion just on which conferences they plan to attend or have the interest in, and that allows administration to ensure that we have um, efficient registration in advance of those conferences. So um, some of you may have re received a confirmation yesterday for email registration. It's simply just to put names on rooms. It's not to say, uh, but the literally the registration open for those rooms for hotel rooms at conferences and they're sold out within minutes so yeah. uh, we were only able to get three rooms at the conference hotel and that was with I had three staff trying to at the same time at nine o'clock when the rooms open so it is a it's a first come first serve and they go really quick so um, this discussion is just really to allow us to register everybody if things change um, later on that's fine it's just um, this is kind of gives us advance uh, warning who wants to go okay so if we want to start with um, obviously Roma is pretty secured unless something significant changes uh, those those attendees are set uh, to attend next week uh, sec two weeks sorry next one is Federation of Communi Canadian Municipalities Sustainability Communities Conference uh, it's in Ottawa February 7th 8th 9th and 10th this isn't something that um, many have attended in the past, but it is an option available. Is it a fairly new conference though? I, I mean, it, it hasn't been around for a while. Yeah, and I think it was only occurring every second year. Yeah. Any interest in that one? And I'll agree. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it doesn't work with my schedule. I am interested in this. Is there any sort of... Um, online or virtual options for I can look into these? it for you yeah that would have be great just I don't know that for sure but I can have a look that's a lot of traveling okay um, and I'll follow up with Councillor Councillor Moncrief will let us know but I'll follow up with Councillor Bernie as well if, we'll if there's interest there um, 
Okay, the next one is the Rainy Lake of the Woods Watershed Forum, which is in International Falls, March 8th and 9th. Uh, Councillor McMillan used to attend fairly regularly, and we haven't had anyone there for quite a few years. Uh, let me check my schedule on that, because I, I talked to Rory about that. He, he, he believes it's valuable mm -hmm. uh, for someone to be there, so... Uh, and, it, and I don't think it's happened in the last few years because of COVID and the restrictions at the border. So um, leave that with me. And okay. if, it, if we feel it's something that someone should attend, I think we should continue to do that. So that's no other interest from council. All right, the next one is Ontario Good Roads Association in Toronto, April 16, 17, 18, 19. Councillor Shays. Marco, to your knowledge, nobody's attending from staff at this time. Okay. Right. Um, shouldn't. Uh, like, I, I think that particular conference uh, is, is a benefit. To, is it no one wants to go or no one's been asked? No, <coughs> there's been a, a, a request go out and, and uh, yeah, staff have not taken the, the opportunity to attend. So if members of council are going, we will... We will discuss that at SLT again because it is important to have administration there to support council. So we will talk yeah. about that at SLT. Yeah, it, is, it is. It, someone will be going. Yeah, there's a heavy reliance on, uh, and a lot of the forums are tied to, uh, are, is good information for staff, at least yeah. they used to be. Okay, so I'll take that away. Uh, the next one is NOMA, so Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association in Thunder Bay, April 26, 27, 28. Uh, so far I've heard from um, Mayor Poirier and Councillor Koch that are do intend, intend to attend. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to put a little plug in here. Um, um, I, I think in the past we've tried, and, and, and again, uh, you know, it's based on people's schedule, but uh, supporting these more district and regional uh, organizations and that is um, it, it is very important in that so if, if there are other counselors that uh, feel they can uh, put the time aside to go on that I think uh, a presence there is um, it, it is beneficial and, and it's noticed um, and uh, we can't support these by not going to conferences uh, and we need to keep these uh, organizations at, as advocates, and especially NOMA, because the next leg after that is AMO. And uh, whatever's decided at NOMA goes to the, the, uh, so the AMO um, board table and that, and um, we get a voice there. So um, just throwing that in there, and again, it's, it's always based on availability, time availability of individuals. So, but if we could get a good contingent, be good. Councillor Van Bellingham? Okay. And I'll check with Councillor Bernie as well. Councillor Moncrief, is, is uh, Noma of interest to you? I know I can't hear her. But <laughs> she, she, she said I could go. Oh, she can go? Sorry, I didn't see that. You can go? I'm, re I'm reading your lips. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Skills. I can backfire. Okay, she will go, I think is what she said. She said she could go. I don't okay. know if she said she can go. <laughs> okay, I will talk to her about that offline. Uh, next one is the Federation of Community Municip Canadian Municipalities, FCM, in Toronto, May 25th, 6th, and 7th, and 8th. This is a very, very, very big conference. It's a what? Very, very big conference. Oh, it's, it's just because one. it's FCM rather than all Ontario. Okay. So you, you know, have people from across the country. Nobody. Well, I, I, I got, I got to see in that because I, I, I don't want to be in Toronto uh, for the next forty-eight months and that. So um, <laughs> there's things that we can accomplish here. So I, I, again, I'll look at schedule and stuff. But um, yeah, and I'd like to see the because um, I know in the past the. Uh, agenda and that it, it was actually a very good conference and I, I know people have attended mm -hmm. in the in the past um, and they've come back raving about it so it, it is a good conference and that but again it's four days in Toronto so it turns into five five days or five and a half days or whatever so 
I put, put me down. I'm gonna see okay. what I can do. Okay. Thanks. Okay, next is Emo. Uh, final conference for the year. Uh, just noting that KDMA will be announced at some point uh, in the next few months here. Normally that conference is held in February, but it was deferred due to the election and the uh, administrator uh, resigned, so there's a vacancy there. So once we know that, that's local anyway. It'll be, it's supposed to be in Dryden. So, Emo, I have uh, Mayor Andrew Poirier and Councillor Moncrief. What's the dates and where? Uh, Emo is August 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd in London. They usually rotate that conference between London and Ottawa. <coughs> okay, so I just have those two for now. Questions of council? No? Okay. Uh, you okay there? Yep. Yeah, okay. Thank you. What you need? Uh, okay. Moving on the agenda. Uh, the next item is uh, Bill Five Advocacy Support. Uh, we have a we had a report attached that uh, individuals were able to read. Uh, who's going? That's to my report. Is there any discussion on? Um, that's an advocacy report uh, in support of Bill Five. So you will see these coming forward from time to time. Um, often I'll receive other municipalities that are advocating for similar issues and sometimes, um, you know, if there's, a, from council, if there's something that you see um, that's been introduced that you particularly wish something to be uh, included, um, which did come to me from a couple of councillors asking for this advocacy to come before our council, so that's why that's here today. Yeah, no, okay. I think it's a good thing. Any questions? Councillor Ben. I don't have any questions. Or but comments. I just, sorry, I just want yeah. to make the comment. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you to Councillor Koch for bringing this to our attention. This is really important legislation to make sure that us at this table are held to the same standards as everyone else when it comes to workplace and harassment safety. Um, a 90 day vacating of seat is not appropriate when um, there is serious misconduct at this table. So thank you, Councillor Koch, for bringing this to our attention. This is really important to advocate for, and hopefully the province will pass this. There's bipartisan support, so thanks. Thank you. <coughs> okay, uh, moving on the agenda, 1.3, uh, community safety and well-being coordinator position. That's Roberta. Uh, Roberta. Okay. Thank you. So the purpose of this report <coughs> is to seek council approval to increase the City of Kenora staff complement uh, and operating budget by one FTE for the purpose of Community Safety Wellbeing Coordinator, uh, which is at the uh, appropriate salary of 87,617, um, and also to include an operating budget of 75,000 for the 2023 uh, budget. Uh, effective January 1 of 2019, the province of Ontario mandated the development and implementation of community safety and well-being planning under Police Services Act. It's important to note that the City of Kenora uh, had, uh, was ahead of the game in 2015 and actually had launched a committee uh, that was working uh, towards community safety. Uh, we all recognize that community safety and well-being uh, planning recognize that uh, we recognize that it's a complex issue and results or requires multiple stakeholder consultation and support uh, by multiple parties. And keeping organized and on top of those priorities is a key responsibility of uh, all members that are on the committee, in the community, and as part of the municipality. Uh, in terms of uh, where we are at, uh, you know, undoubtedly COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, has uh, caused increased risk and, and put pressure on our community. And in response to, uh, you know, some issues in our community, Council as champions expressed their commitment to community safety and well-being planning in a special meeting that was held December 29th, 2022. Uh, Council at that meeting rallied for support uh, from the public uh, and community, and this is uh, an outcome of those conversations. So the Community Safety Wellbeing Coordinator is responsible for the coordination and management uh, and support of really the plan and the actions that are outlined 
uh, by the community and through that committee. Uh, and we'll work to build relationships and uh, keep actions moving as, as we move forward. Uh, the key tasks of the coordinator are outlined in the report and the operating budget would really be there to support any activity that is coming out of the committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chase. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, not really questions, but just some general comments. Um, not to, to sort of position it as concerns, but um, when evaluating the job description, thinking about who the target market would be for who this employee will be, I have concerns that the salary range might be too low. Um, I, I'm worried about being able to attract the right kind of professional with the experience that we're seeking, especially in a high profile position that takes a lot of flack from this community. This person is going to be under a lot of pressure. They're going to be expected to relate with agencies and, and government, different levels of government and at a very high level. And uh, I have serious concerns that we're maybe um, shooting ourselves in the foot here and not setting the city up for success by being able to attract and retain uh, the level of a professional that we need uh, for this type of role. Um, and secondly, in looking at um, you know the formation of this committee, a uh, safety committee, the, the All Nations Health Partners has a working group um, already being established to that that works with the stakeholders. So I'm, I'm a bit concerned we're creating another silo unintentionally when the individual that's going to be taking over this role could very well seek appointment to that working group. It'll report back to that board. I'm a member of that board. I can report back to council and we can eliminate just another committee. We have a there's, there's a pattern here in our community, and for, for better or worse, I mean, people can refer to Kenora as Committee City, and I don't know that that is necessarily the most efficient way to, to roll out this individual's work um, by, by getting community members from different agencies that are already sitting on all nations working groups um, to run a committee and participate in a committee off the side of their desk and just another committee. So uh, those are some of my concerns. Uh, I just want you to take that into consideration um, and maybe reevaluate uh, how this person could really effectively and efficiently work in the community and, and hopefully we can attract somebody that really will be a champion of, of this role for our community. It's very important we heard that at the public meeting. Um, how, how, how significant it is to, to make sure we're successful in rolling this out. And again, this person's gonna be under a lot of pressure. We, we know uh, how ugly our social media is in this community. We know what people are saying on the streets. We know what visitors are saying and are afraid of. Um, th this person will, uh, will be taking a lot of, it's, it's a high pressure job. And we need to attract somebody who has uh, not just thick skin, but has significant experience in managing this kind of a role and working with the individuals and groups that they're gonna have to work with. So I just wanted to express that to them. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Councillor Chase, uh, Councillor Pendleton. A lot of my points are just reiterations of Councillor Chase's, so I won't do that, but um, I do also have hesitations around the salary. Um, and another thing that I thought to think about in this role is that ideally you'd want someone who already has a sort of connection to the community, so they're generally at a uh, perhaps later stage in their career advancement and so I, I worry that we're not attracting who our target demographic would be for this role at that at that wage. Everything else? Councillor Jesus said and I'm sorry I have a problem with it. Uh, can we because we we have other and then we can come back because I think it's important we have this discussion. Um, so, uh, Councillor Moncrief uh, has a question on... She has uh, two questions. How many positions on the restructured staffing chart at the non-union level have yet to be filled, and is this a temporary position? If so, the wording doesn't reflect this. Uh, so, the idea was not to have this as a temporary position. This was coming forward as an addition to our staffing com complement, so it would be a permanent position. Uh, Request, or full-time requests that we are making. Um, in terms of the number of <coughs> positions that are uh, vacant, I will have to get that exact number for you. I don't have that on the, on the top of my at the fingertips right now, but I will have that before end of the meeting today. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, Councillor Koch. Uh, thank you. I 
Uh, everybody's on the same <laughs> wavelength, I think, today. I, I would echo Councillor Chase and Councillor Van Bellingham's concerns about the salary. Thank you for confirming it's a permanent position. Um, I think it's just a language that you said. Yeah. You know. um, and I just, uh, I know Councillor Chase, you said um, that the there may be some duplication or, or as silos if there's another committee, but I also note that it's in the legislation that there has to be a committee, so um, that's something we'll just have to navigate. Thanks. Okay. Councillor Matson. Well, <laughs> I want to make sure that we're also very cognizant of our budget when we are looking at the wages for this person, and this person would be on the grid, so there would be increases, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just comment thank you um, so uh, again without duplicating that the salary that's the thing that stuck out to me not uh, just for that type of individual we he, whoever he or she is um, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that that cuts it anymore that's just the reality of the marketplace um, and uh, um, Councillor Kocha brought up where we are mandated to have this uh, my only concern about uh, it, you know, having other committees there working on behalf of this, which is fine, and, it, and I think, I believe they can still be used, um, is, the, the, you know, the viability of that committee and how they move forward um, and what they could bring to that, like, to this position, and are they willing to do that? I mean, there, there would have to be insurances, and, and I think, um, without discounting the All Nations Health Partners, because uh, I know we're really, uh, sort of honing in on trying to get people to work together, hopefully, instead of working in silos, which is not working in the community right now, and we all know that. So, um, as much as I agree with if we could have someone else, I think we have to go through this process, and and uh, um, and I think as we're going through the agenda, and that I think uh, we've had some comments from people about like the size of the community and that, which is in my mind, the way it sits now, problematic, or it could be, because I think there's too many people. So uh, I think we can have that discussion as we sort of flow through the meeting today. Yeah. Sure. And just, just follow up comments, and uh, I yeah. mean, I th again, yeah. we're all, we all appear to be on the same wave, but thank you, Councillor Kosh, for reminding us of the mandate that we're required to have that committee. My, the two, two things that come to mind for me, I mean, we have an allocated uh, by operating budget for this committee of $75,000. Um, so I mean, I, I don't know that we're going to need that much. Um, obviously, it might be a trial and error type of thing, depending on how much work and outreach and what their expenses are going to be. So I, I'm kind of curious as to how admin came up with that operating budget. I, I would hate to set an operating budget of 75 allocated and then it just flows to reserves. I mean, I don't want to be building reserves in this. I want it to be used. And, and if we had to lower the operating budget because we're shooting too high, that could easily be flowed into the salary uh, to offset uh, other uh, budgetary requirements. Um, and then the only other comment, and this is something I can find out. We have an All Nations Partners meeting today that I'm going to be attending. One of the agenda items is discussing the, the working group that they have established. Perhaps there's an opportunity for that working group to come under our, under our umbrella and we can be, you know, to fulfill our mandate and requirement uh, and provide, uh, provide something that we can work. So I'll discuss that with the partners uh, and try to bring some more, uh, more information back to council here and how that's structured. But again, my concern is duplication and multiple committees. It's the same, in the, the people serving that committee are the same, it's the same people. So why would they want to sit on two committees? Yeah, again, so again, a lot of these individuals are, are are running with very tight budgets, doing this type of work off the side of their desk or on a volunteer basis or offsetting uh, their paid time at work to fulfill their programs and services to their clients in order to, to do this committee work. And I just, I want to make sure that, you know, big picture as a, as a whole community, we're, we're being as efficient and on the same page and, and working together. So. Um, so yeah, thank you for thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Councilor Moncrief. Oh. Where does this position live? Is it an HR position? Uh, right now, this is this is not uh, an HR position. Uh, it will be reporting to the office of the CAO, and so that will be uh, definitely at a priority level where it's direct interaction with the CAO and Mayor Council. So that the senior I, level. I believe that's in the report. Yeah. And I just want to sorry, just to Councilor changes. Chase's comments, uh, even before everything happened in, in December, well, e even going back, um, we have some committees that are, and this was one of them, um, 
how do you how do you do something like I know there are advisory committees, but how do you do something as a committee if you don't have any goals or you don't have any resources? <coughs> and so even before all this came up, senior leadership and I were having conversations specifically about this committee and specifically about the sustainability committee because we've got a sustainability committee, we've got a sustainability action plan, and we got zero bucks. So I had conversations with senior leadership about putting in $75,000, and I'm not going to, that's an arbitrary number. It's not too much, not too little. We're trying to find that, you know, uh, right temperature of uh, oatmeal there from the three bears. Uh, but the point is, is we wanted to be able to make sure that there was something that the committees could have to be able to do things, and it, it does cost money to do things, whether that's uh, you know, yes, there's some things that we can do, uh, policy changes or things that we can do within existing staffing resources, but when you look at some of the deliverables, and, and even if you look at the draft community and well-being plan, there's things in there that cost, you have to spend money on to get it done. So I think we are, um, like, yeah, and, and, and so the point, the point of that was, those were going to be options presented to council to consider at budget time. And if you guys decide that this is an area that you want to uh, invest in as a council, that's up to you. And at the end of the day, you know, we're talking a lot about the budget. The budget process is trade-offs. Add a project, cut a project. Um, take a little bit more money out, out of debt, don't. Um, take a little bit more money out of the bank, don't. Those are the decisions that you're gonna have at the budget table, and so it's really about um, where, where do you want to put the most focus on? And so um, $75,000, if you want less, we can put in less. If you want more, we can put in more. Um, we're just, you know, again, this we were sort of trying to figure out how to prepare for budget in advance of anything that took place over the holidays and in December uh, in the downtown core. And so that speaks to just sort of the logic and some of the thinking that we had around that initial decision. Um, but there's nothing set in stone, uh, and, and we're happy to listen to council's okay. feedback at the budget table. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming that answered uh, uh, Councillor Moncrief's question. Uh, Councillor Koch. Um, thank you. Two things. Um, is the development of the new plan, is that something that's included in the $75,000 budget? Uh, yes. It is uh, not right now. I can tell you we've had preliminary conversations with I thought it is. the plan is in the budget. The, the development. The, no, the dollar value would be used to support any development or renew of the plan, correct or no? L let me rephrase. We could use the $75,000 to work on the plan if we chose to. Thank you. Uh, I, I will be honest, My um, the state of the draft plan is something that I've only really gotten in the last six weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, when we were <coughs> thinking about putting money in the operating budget, I didn't necessarily conceive of a new plan at that time. But now that we've had the opportunity to see when the engagement took place, what the draft plan looks like, and understanding that things have changed over the last four years, um, yeah, I think we need to do a new plan. And so we could use that if council wanted to use the money in that way. OK. Uh, thank you. And secondly, um, and this might be creeping into the terms of reference discussion, but um, just to the point of the different committees and duplication and all that, I think the opportunity lives for us to say, what is crime prevention and community well-being mean for us and the things that we can do on that committee that exist outside of the mental health and addictions working group that lives at All Nations Health Partners. Um, there will be some overlap, but I think there's bigger work there at, at the crime prevention committee than will live just at the All Nations group. So something to consider when we're looking at what that committee will will do. Thank you. Thank, uh, any other questions? No. Okay, so um, so just so everybody's clear in that we're gonna uh, we're gonna take a look at the salary. Um, I think there was agreement here that you're going to have to look at something, I, unless we get awful lucky in that, but I suggest we're not going to. So um, so we're going to have to keep that in mind moving forward. Um, so that'll come back to uh, Council on uh, like next week uh, for approval. So if there's any additional information that you need to add to the recommendation or the report, sure. then to, uh, have that completed, please. Sure, and we can just track changes on that. And yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so moving on to item 1.4, uh, <coughs> amend terms of reference for for the Crime Prevention and Community Wellbeing Advisory Committee. Uh, and I'm assuming there will be uh, some discussion here after. Yeah, there. 
Uh, this was the uh, Mayor Poirier asked for this terms of reference to come forward for Council to have initial discussion on, you know, this, this hasn't been looked at since 2021. Uh, we have a new Council um, and, and this is an area of concern and an area, a priority area for Council at this time. So the intention obviously is to appoint the committee members. Uh, we have a, a various vacancies on the committee. Um, but prior to advertising for those vacancies, we want to have the discussion around um, maybe the composure as well as um, some of the content of the you know, terms of reference for the committee overall. Um, just as a procedural recommendation, I think that this committee, you know, you could have a lot of public interest in this committee and it might be uh, wise to have some procedural processes included in the terms of reference, which I can add if that is the case. <coughs> I didn't get into adding them all in advance. I just wanted to hear uh, the input from council prior to doing that. Um, so really, I'm turning it over to council. Councillor Bernie has provided his comments just in the event he couldn't connect today. And uh, Mayor Poirier has those comments. Yeah, so I, I, I will read those out, uh, but if we want to uh, Maybe start on this side of the. Uh, if there's any questions, Councilor Chase. No. Uh, Councilor I want to hear what Councilor says. I did. Okay. Not, sorry. Um, my question is, I guess, what are our goals for this committee? Like, I think we need definable outcomes to make this successful, and so I think that I'm sure there'll be part of that in this. But I think that's something that we need to discuss as a as a council is. Crime prevention and community, like that, what does that mean at, right. at a tangible level in this community, okay. and what are the outcomes we're hoping to get from this? Okay, I'm just going to go around. Uh, does Lisa have a question? No? Nope. Uh, nothing. I don't so see anything. Councillor oh, Manson? Yeah. Um, same thing. I want to know what our outcomes should be <coughs> so through the terms of reference. I think it's really important. Uh, I have something, but I'll save it for after. Okay, do you want me to read yeah. uh, what, uh, um, well, it may answer some questions. Not, and again, this is um, uh, Councillor Bernie's suggestion. Um, so what he's saying is uh, uh, limiting the membership to nine plus one councillor, whoever that may be, uh, for the sake of efficiency and decision-making ability. And I tend to agree with that. Uh, and he just lays this out, and again, it's just for discussion, employee of the municipality uh, education sector, uh, so it could be from the college, universities, or the district school board section, whatever. Um, health sector, uh, mental health sector, <coughs> community and social service sector, uh, children and youth sector, uh, custodial services for children and youth, uh, OPP detachment commander or uh, surrogate, uh, uh, council member would be 10 and then he has asterisks uh, like a, a mem say a member at large <coughs> and he follows up with a uh, member at large should be carefully considered the role may not be appropriate for this advisory committee so he's he's put it out there but he's not sure if, if that's what we want to be looking at um, he's suggesting waiting until February council meeting to recommend amendments to this bylaw in order to allow council to review any proposed changes, and I tend to agree there. If the majority of council are in agreement with the number of members and adopting terms of reference at this time, I will support the motion. So that's what he left, of course. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a follow up. Um, <coughs> I mean, the suggestions of members, I mean, I think cover most of the bases, but in my opinion, uh, and maybe this is not appropriate, but and I put it to the floor for discussion or maybe somebody can answer for me. Why aren't we considering having somebody from the Ministry of the Attorney General's Office, a Crown, somebody in the justice world? Um, I think that's a very important component that's missing on that list and, and definitely a sector that we yeah. need to engage because they're yeah. part of not just the solutions <coughs> but kind of part of the problems right now. Not yeah. that, like we have to yeah. be on, have, I know it's tough to hear that and say that um, but we have to have honest conversations about this and we have, I, I personally have major concerns about how the law is being applied and we can blame the police, but when individuals are being released with no plans and uh, yeah, there, there's serious flaws in justice that also need to be discussed at this committee level um, and without inviting them to be at the table and seeking their participation so that 
some of their knowledge could come back to our table so we can be educated on where these gaps are and what we need to advocate for, I think it's something that we need to consider. And again, I will open it to the floor if anybody else has comments or, or anything on that topic. Any? Oh, uh, Councillor Matson. Graham, I totally agree with that. I think it's <coughs> imperative that we have somebody from the justice system on this committee. Also, what about somebody from the business sector? Yeah, because well, they've okay. been affected quite a bit by this, so I think you need both sides at the table. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cox? Uh, thank you. I would I would echo both Councillor Benson and Councillor Chase's recommendations. I also wondered about including language about the type of representation we're asking for uh, from each of sort of the list of voting members. Um, I think it will be helpful for somebody to, not necessarily <coughs> a decision maker at the top level of the organization, but somebody who could commit the organization to whatever task or whatever actionable item would fall under that uh, organization's purview. Um, so not just not just somebody who will be doing the work, but somebody who can decide that that work will be done. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to step back from the chair here and I just have a couple comments. Um, um, I, I was going to bring up the fact that, because uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with uh, the executive of uh, uh, the chamber, uh, met last week with them actually for about two and a half hours. We, I updated them on what council was doing up to that point and some of the things we were looking at doing going forward. <coughs> and they're keen to be uh, part of the solution too, because uh, they have a stake in all this also. It's, it's not just about, it, it's about safety in the downtown and uh, continuing to uh, have businesses operate um, under safe, safe conditions. So, um, the, and, and just from a call or a discussion I had yesterday, uh, just thinking about this, uh, I'm just wondering if we're maybe putting the cart before the horse on this one. I, I, I know we have to go up and hire someone, and I think you were. I think that's where you were coming from. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we just sort of we can have this and we can discuss it, like the makeup. Um, but I would like to see, um, you know, how we're going about developing the plan um, and what's in the plan. Because um, what if we get all this wrong, or we're only representing half of what we need to, or we're, we've got the mix wrong? And I don't know. Uh, maybe it's fine, but I, I'm just wondering if we need time to go in that direction and start developing the plan, and um, then start looking at that. Because I've had lots of calls from people in a lot of these sectors that are willing to uh, be part of this uh, advisory committee or committee or whatever it's going to be. Uh, so I, I don't think there's going to be. I don't think it's going to be hard to. Um, when we reach out to get people from these, and I would say about 70% uh, of those uh, areas or sectors, uh, I've had uh, at least one, in some cases, two calls from, from organizations or individuals that would be willing to step up. So that was good to hear. Um, I, you know, as long as we keep the needle moving, I think they're interested. So I, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Um, you know, uh, that's why we have these discussions at, at at these at committee level, but I'm just wondering if we start on the recruitment, get that pinned down, and then start on like, you know, the development of the plan or the revision of the existing plan, whatever we want to call it, um, and then at some point we can see the the basis of that plan, and then you know we might come back and and a majority of council may say this does not this does not work for what we've developed or we need to add or we need to move things around. So I, I'm just kind of throwing that out right now without stopping the process because I, I truly do not want to do that. Um, but maybe we're, you know, maybe we, we need to work uh, from a different vantage point. So. Could I, I speak from an administrative perspective? Sure. Sure. Just Councillor Malcrief has oh, one. Sorry, oh, sorry, let her go ahead. Uh, agree with Councillor Jays and the <coughs> suggestion membership there's a youth custodial services rep but not adult. Why is this? <coughs> um, do you want me to answer that? So the development of the initial framework of the committee was really driven by the provincial's frame, provincial uh, framework that was presented. So when Adam did the development of this, this committee, 
um, pretty clear on the ministry site, you know, well, what the responsibilities of are of the committee and who those suggested members should be. It says should, not shall. So it does leave that open for council's, you know, discretion. They can decide what type of membership, but they do provide a framework for councils to start with. So that is the reason why that person is there. Uh, Councilor Kodger. Thank you. I would just also offer that I, I feel like adult custodial, it's kind of covered in some of the other representation. Uh, and also if we're inviting Mag, um, I think that kind of covers part of that as well. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to share sort of uh, my perspective, administration's perspective on this. So there, there's two fundamental issues. How do you set up the city employee to be successful? And how do you set up the committee to be successful? And, and it's important to know, and the province does this from time to time, you shall do this. There's going to be 400 plus different approaches to this across Ontario, and so they haven't really told us how to do this. They've provided some, you know, some, you know, uh, tracks that we need to kind of remain on. You need to have a committee. These are the types of things you want to focus on. But I think what really concerns me, and I think the challenge that the previous council faced was, how do you develop a plan without a committee, and how? But ultimately, it falls under the city. And so we've been having some conversations with the Crime Prevention Network over the past couple weeks uh, administratively. And I think, <coughs> I think kind of we need a two-pronged approach. Uh, I think the public is expecting city council to do something, but we need to understand that city council's bucket is, has limits. There's some things that we have control over, and there's other things that we don't have control over. So what I would suggest is when we're working on the plan, I think we should really focus department by department what we can do that falls within our own bucket. So what can we do in bylaw? What can we do in recreation? What can we do um, in other areas of the city to be able to advance things forward? Because that's what we can control. And you know, you're going to expect me to hold the coordinator accountable, but what am I holding them accountable to if they're supposed to implement a plan that they don't have control over implementing? So I, I think we need sort of a, a part of the strategy, and, and sorry, like we, we've, <coughs> coming back to the draft plan, there's 32 action items right now, you know, in the draft, no dedicated staffing, and only 14 of them fall in the city's control. So that's not a great place to start. So I think we need sort of, this is what the city is going to do in the plan, and then I think we need to have sort of a smaller level of things that we're going to try and influence uh, through our relationships and through our platform with other community organizations and through the committee. But at the end of the day, even the committee, you know, one person from this organization or one person from business, they're not going to be able to influence anything and actually get anything done. Um, without the support of the coordinator and without the support of other people around that table and without resourcing. So um, my advice would be the plan needs to have a very specific component that focuses on what falls in the city's bucket and purview and that we can actually make changes on and invest in and then a smaller number of things that we're going to try and work on as a community. Um, because otherwise, I think it's going to be very difficult for you to hold me accountable and holding that person accountable on delivering things that they don't have any control over. And that's been the real rub and the real gap, I think, as uh, the previous council and our previous administration has tried to move this forward because um, it's going to take, I, I, people have said it at the meeting, it's going to take a community to resolve some of these issues and to improve some of these issues. Um, and I don't want to artificially inflate expectations in the community about saying, you know, the city's going to do X through this mechanism when we don't have control over that. So as a CAO, uh, as the representative for administration, those are the things that are going through my head as we try and figure out how to move forward. And we had a conversation, like I said, with crime prevention. I said, hey, tell me what uh, the most frequent mistakes you see other municipalities make in this type of work. Tell me uh, what do municipalities have in common that are really successful in this type of work. Um, you know, it's tough too. I see municipalities with 200 page uh, community safety, crime prevention, and well-being, 200 pages. I don't know if we need 200 pages. I think we need to look inwards at what can the city do to make this problem better, and how do we want to use the committee? And that's the real challenge. The province hasn't told us, you know, how, how, do, how do you 
uh, hold the committee accountable and, and how do you create deliverables that the community can actually deliver on? And that's actually, I think, a pretty tough challenge and we need to try and figure out how to get through it. Um, we'll continue to have conversations on the administrative side, but I wanted to share you my perspective because when Roberta and I sat down and, and you know we were debriefing on the December 29th meeting and we were trying to figure out, well, how do you put up a, uh, a job description and the, the initial draft was sort of, they'll support the commu committee these ways but they weren't really, it was about the committee more than the city, and that's, there's an imbalance there. So we need to figure out how to strike that balance between moving things forward for the city and providing support to this committee and to the individuals around the table to be able to deliver on the goals that we agree on. And, and so um, I don't know how to agree on goals as a committee when we don't even know who's at the committee table. So I hope that's helpful. I, I know I'm sort of, you know, it's a lot of words coming out, but that's sort of <coughs> going on in my mind is we're trying to figure out how to make this successful because um, you, you, it's not going to be successful if we don't clearly articulate what the expectations are and what we're expecting from this person and from the committee. And, uh, you know, uh, I think the joint priority setting, that's, you can reflect on what I just shared and I think we'll have an opportunity to talk about this uh, during our priority setting conversation and I hope that um, I hope that helps you frame your thoughts for how you want to show up, uh, you know, in future discussions around these issues because um, it uh, is going to take some work and some real thought and focus to, to make sure that we maximize the success of this position in this committee. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Okay, I'm going to, uh, this is not my area of expertise, right? I'm a banker or whatever, so my, I think going back to putting the cart before the horse having that person in place and developing the plan feels like the steps that should be the starting point because i don't understand how we give a committee procedural bylaws if we don't understand what our deliverables are and i think that we're going to get into a 32 list with 14 of the act if we don't do that process of making sure that we have an understanding of what our goal is at the end of this because what does safety mean you can ask me you can ask Councillor Chase you can ask Councillor Clodge Councillor Manson and there we're all going to give you different answers to that question and we need to figure that out as a community is what are our deliverable actionable items that we are hoping to attain. And part of this will include advocacy because I know that everyone knows these are bigger issues than, than the city of Kenora, than the city of, of, of any municipality. These are much bigger issues. These are systemic issues. And we as a council can get much, much better at advocacy and making sure that we are being very clear as to the systemic inequities and um, issues that we're facing as a community that are directly impacting our city. We, we, we understand that. So there are bigger pieces to this that are outside of our jurisdiction, but we don't, I mean, I don't, maybe, maybe I've missed something, but I don't feel that we've done the step of what are our goals as to what safety and crime prevention means. So, and that might just be my complete ignorance of this process and being the new person on the block. Councillor Manson and then Councillor um, Maybe I'm looking at it a little differently. I understand what you're saying, Kyle, but shouldn't this position also be a champion for the community to pull the community together so that at the table we all can come with different solutions? Yeah, and I don't think that anything that I, I, I don't believe that anything that I said necessarily um, doesn't allow for that possibility. It's, it's just, um, because I think our city is looking for a champion. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and they should yeah. be a champion, but yeah. but they talk is one thing. Yeah. And so championing <coughs> is one thing, but at the end of the day, the public is looking for results. Yeah. And I'm just telling you, um, you, you can see how you can create a situation where it's hard to get results. And I, I even think about, you know, we've had the Trails Committee referenced here. Great, we've got a Trails Advisory Committee with no budget. They, they, they can't do anything, they can't tell us what to do, and that's frustrating 
when you're sitting there as a trails committee member. So I'm also trying to think about what the future members on this committee are, and we're going to have people that are going to volunteer time away from their families and their job to contribute, and they want to be part of the solution. And if they don't see them, if they don't see wins, and they don't see themselves as being part of the solution, that's going to become frustrating, and we're going to be right back where we started. I think it's so, really important. We have to have wins. Yeah, and, and I. I you know, so I'm just, I, I don't have it all figured out either, to Councillor Van Bellingham's point. I'm just trying to share the, the real, um, some of the real obstacles that I see in place um, to making this successful. And, 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 and of course, the challenge is, it's going to take some time, and we all know the urgency that we all feel individually in our roles, that we feel from the community. It's palpable. You, yeah. you feel it, right? And so we want to move quickly, but we also want to get it right. Um, Mr. Chair, I think Roberta has... Yeah, I, I think it's really important that we understand the accountability and authority that this role will have. Um, you know, we, we have to understand that the buckets that they are dealing with, even within the municipality, come under uh, other types of authorities, including council decision. So when we take a look at um, the expectations of this individual, uh, we really need to be mindful, uh, you know, especially when we talk about champion, uh, is, that word, is that word the right placement on this individual? Are we all champions in terms of what actually has to come forward and how does this individual feed up into that? So, it, you know, when we think about someone coming in as we spoke about before, that is a, that, those, the, um, the opportunity for success has to be attainable for someone to actually step into those types of roles. And I think that these are really complex issues there's multiple facets to those issues. There's multiple levels of authority and decision making that do not fall to any one administration individual uh, to actually move forward and, and make a change uh, that we may need. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that the legislation um, and the, the format of uh, what the province had laid out doesn't speak to one coordinator. It actually has contemplates coordinators um, meaning that um, our other stakeholders that are key, our participants in the safety and health of the community may also choose uh, to invest in a coordinator of their own to work and help continue advance the legwork that actually has to happen behind those committees and investing that focus. So um, those are all the contemplations when we talk about a position and we think about, you know, uh, how will we present it to an individual, how do we make this job something someone can wrap their arms around and actually uh, make a di difference because we want success in our community, but that individual is going to want success as well. So uh, I'm just going to step back from the chair. <clears throat> Again, I, I, I'm wondering if we're, we're, uh, we're trying to make this more I know it's a complex issue, but I, we're, it almost sounds like we're complicating things here. Um, we're uh, we're, we're going to decide today to move forward in the like, recommending council, uh, the position. But when I look at the position in that, I, I look at, yes, it's under the auspices of the city. I see very limited um, things happening through the city. Uh, but what I do, uh, the, the and that's why it's key to getting the right person that this person is going to be uh, and I don't use champion or whatever I use it he or she is going to be a conduit into politicians ears and whether it's at whatever level um, and being able to build that network where they can pick up the phone and phone this ministry that person that staffer I mean that's going to be the big challenge of this new position because um, we're not going to solve the problems at this table. I mean, we, we have to be realistic. But it's, it's how we can uh, advocate on behalf of some of these other organizations that aren't, that aren't doing the job right now. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, they're working hard. But it's not getting done because they're out and about doing things on their own. And that does not work. It doesn't work in any situation. So... Like to me, that's that's the biggest piece, and I know we're talking about how to deliver that. It's going to be very difficult, not because you can make a call and you might not have any action for six months, and then all of a sudden you have action. That's how government works, especially at the upper levels. So, um, I, I just wonder if we're 
almost like when we're talking about setting it up for failure and that like I think there's other models out there let's not try and reinvent the wheel all the time there's other models out there there's many other communities because uh, I've spoke to some mayors that have these in place and, and yes they're a lot more cumbersome than what we'd be looking at we don't need a 200 page plan um, but I, I, I think if we have those discussions and outreach and, and move this forward, and it's going to be step by step by step by step. Let's hire someone. Let's start that process. Then let's start looking at what a plan may look at. And it might be 12 drafts before we get it right. I don't know, but we have to get it right. Uh, and the eyes and the ears of the community are uh, upon us now because we set ourselves up for that, right, in that meeting. Um, but it's important that we move forward that way. So um, I just like, you know, there's going to be bumps along the way. This is not going to be a smooth process. And I think we just start and start working towards it. And if we have regular updates, we will have more to say about what the process, what the plan looks like, and then ultimately what a committee structure would look like. It, uh, I, don't, I just, I, I'm sorry, but just. Maybe I'm naive now from being around this chamber for so many years. Um, we always make things so bloody complicated when we're trying to solve something uh, because we think, I guess that's what we have to do. And I think that's the way we're going here. And not like, we're way beyond our discussion today about where we're even at. And I think we need more data, more information in front of us. Then we can have that discussion. That, my opinion. Thank you. I guess all that I would say, Mr. Chair, is that the, the comments that I'm sharing are actually meant to simplify. I, I actually think part of the reason that this hasn't been successful yet is because it's been complicated. And it's only through clear expectations that we can actually simplify the process. I don't, look, we can hire a person and we can start working on the plan. I'm not suggesting that we need to hold up or anything like that. We just need to um, be conscious as we hit each step of the path that we're um, can I just ask Councillor Moncrief to try one more time? No, okay. I thought maybe I'd get her. So she did make a comment, can those be done in parallel? And I believe that was back <coughs> on uh, when Kyle was speaking. Um, can the plan and the hiring be done in parallel? Did you mean the plan and the hiring, Councillor Moncrief? Uh, she's going to type. Maybe if I reset it, we'll reset when we go into closed and I'll do okay. that will work. Okay. <coughs> okay. It's okay, she said. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, I think we've uh, we've had a, a thorough discussion on that item. So, um, uh, so I'm just not clear where are are we making any amendments or are we just tabling this until February? Well, I mean, may I? Yes. Thank you. Um, I don't want to table it to February. I mean, uh, I don't know what salary range to <coughs> suggest. I would, you know, default to Roberta's expertise and, again, evaluating the type of professional that we're looking to recruit, the type of experience that we're looking for, I think is a bit higher level than where the salary range is. So um, I'm glad that we've had this wholesome discussion. I think it's, it's really setting us up for hopefully some success here. But I think, I think whoever ends up, the individual bring, coming to the table will obviously probably come with um, a certain level of expertise um, and probably a, a version of their own plan as well that they can contribute and make sure that they're successful in this role. So, um, so anyway, I just, that, that was my only comment. Um, I, I don't want to delay for the sake of delaying. I mean, if we can revise, if you've already got a scale uh, that you can propose, I don't know if this is, 100 plus, whatever, uh, I think you can tell the commitment the city wants to make in terms of council and mayor that we, we want to make an investment in hiring the right person and attracting somebody who's really going to succeed here So and bring significant experience to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Chase. But I, I think what uh, the <coughs> clerk was referring to was, uh, I think 1.3 we decided that will come forth next time. They're going to take a look at the salary range. Uh, it was 1.4 she was referring to, okay. which was the advisory or makeup of the advisory committee. Is that something 
I think we should table that. That will table for the time being and uh, revisit it once we get further along in the process. Is that fair yes. to say? Okay, so procedurally, just so council um, understands, it will still come before you because it's a committee level mm -hmm. report. It'll still come before you as a resolution at uh, next week's meeting, and there will be uh, the need for an introduction of a deferral to the February committee level meeting. Just so you're wondering okay. why it's there. Okay, every everybody, okay. With that? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, moving on the agenda, item number three, engineering infrastructure, uh, 3.1, uh, drinking water quality management system regulatory approval, and I guess that's your yep. report, uh, Michael? Primarily, it's just a housekeeping issue where we need some signatures on element three of the drinking water quality management standard plan to satisfy the provincial requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. So this is done on an annual basis <coughs> where the plan gets reviewed, updated, and uh, I guess signed off uh, per <coughs> element three of that plan uh, by the mayor uh, and upper administration and those working on the plan. Okay. Uh, any questions of council? <laughs> <laughs> it was long. It was long. Sorry. Yeah, the council got. I don't have any questions. In fact, I just wanted to comment how much I appreciated the many pages that was this report. Um, I found myself going, oh, I wonder this. And then a few pages later, the question was answered. So I just really appreciated um, all the risk mitigation information that was in there and, and all the sort of backup plans for backup plans that was incorporated into that, really. Yeah, I wanted to make sure council was aware of, of the plan itself. That's why that attachment came with it. It wasn't just, oh, please sign this and you don't know what you're mm -hmm. signing. So I wanted to provide some context and some information, I guess, you know, on, on how intricate and detailed the plans that, that are worked on here and, and are in place for drinking water safety. Yeah, it was great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Any other questions of council? No? Okay, thank you. So that'll come forth. Uh, council next week. Uh, 3.2. Uh, Food Cycler, Household Organic Waste Diversion, Phase 2 Budget Commitment. Yeah, I'll uh, deliver this report really quick, Mr. Chair. So I'm not going to belabor all the point in the report. You've had an opportunity to review it. I think uh, high level, um, Council made an investment during the previous term in the Food Cycler technology. Uh, it was very successful. We sold out the units in six days. We've had a lot of, um, you know, anecdotally, we've had a lot of requests for more uptake on the program. So I think the, the details that are most important is um, we're looking for, because we don't have a budget right now, we're looking for $84,750 today, and, and predominantly that's the cash flow. And the, the reason of the urgency is um, there's a January 31st date to get into this subsidized funding agree, uh, uh, agreement that uh, Impact Canada Food Waste Reduction Challenge, that partnership with Food Cycle Science Corporation. That's the urgency and why we're not waiting for budget because if we don't get in on January 31st, uh, we can't get the subsidized rate. Um, so even though it's gonna be 84,750, at the end of the day, it's only going to, our net cost will be 28,500 when we sell all the units, which we anticipate we will do. And uh, for, that's for option one. And um, there's some money coming out of the Bearwise Reserve, and then there's a little bit coming out of Solid Waste Reserve, but, but nothing that's going to impact operating there. We've created a couple extra options there for you, um, just to add in an extra $5,000 or $10,000 for accessories, because they do get to a point where the charcoal is worn and you need to replace the filters, or if you need a new basket. So we're giving Council the option to purchase some additional accessories that people could purchase here, rather than having to go through Food Cycle or Amazon or whatever. Um, but uh, the base uh, program that we are recommending today is uh, $84,750, which will net to $28,500 um, once all the units are sold. And then, like I said, um, just a couple accessory add-ons if council wishes to go that route. But that's really the high-level information you need to know. Okay, uh, Councillor Van Thank you again for another full sum report. Do we have any discretion when it comes to the model type quantities is it set um it's it's set by the by the program okay. offering and by food cycle science corporation and my sorry if i may um i understand you just need the um for the eighty four thousand seventy five hundred. my recommendation would be the ten thousand towards the additional as someone who has one in their house 
the based on the costing that you have in here, this is more cost effective than purchasing through Amazon or Food Cycler. And this is, um, it gets very stinky if you do not um, keep the filters updated. The other thing that I was um, would that would like to push back on Food Cycler is that this is a great program in create in reducing food waste, but those filters are very wasteful. Um, and this is something that has been brought up to Food Cycler before, but them looking at a program where they take the, or I don't know if we can do it, I'm talking about this, I don't know, at the municipality le level of taking the filters back and finding a way of disposing those in a more efficient manner, I think would be something worth considering as well. That's yeah, I certainly wouldn't have um, an answer today on the filter yep, yep. Uh, disposal, but I could certainly <coughs> have that conversation with uh, Marco and Makesh, our manager in the area, and, and I'm sure we could at least look into something. Any other questions of council? Uh, Lisa doesn't have anything typed up there. No? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, that'll come forward. Uh, for could I just get clarity? Um, I know Councillor Van Bellingham mentioned, and, and she is correct. Um, it is. It would be more cheaper to uh, our residents to buy um, replacement items through the city. Uh, they, there is a. They are reduced here, um, as opposed to what you would get in the market. Uh, so that's really the question I'm looking for. Do you want to do the accessories as well? The, what I will say that um, the accessories cannot be returned. So if we didn't sell them, we would be stuck with them. Um, but given the uptake that we've had and the number of units in the city. Uh, you know, we're fairly optimistic we could probably get rid of those. Fine. No. I'm fine. Councilor Ben. Uh, do we have discretion as to what accessories? Because it said buckets and filters. I would focus more of the budget on the filters. Like using the, uh, I, when did this program come up? We haven't replaced our bucket, I guess, since it came out and we purchased it. It's not pretty by any means, but it's no. fairly, and it seems durable enough. That would be where I would put more of yeah, you know, there was a list, Councillor Van Bellingham, of accessories available, and I thought administrative, if you guys sort of gave us a budget, we would, but that's sort of where we're leaning, is we focus more on the filters. Um, maybe have a couple buckets and just sort of see how it goes. But. Can, I just have one? Can I just add one comment sure. to this? Um, so just for Council to keep in mind, um, supporting the program overall, there's an intent behind the reason why you support the program, which is to reduce, um, you know, addition into our landfill supporting um, the filters is is now uh, supporting a certain number of residents um, and it's not a broad-based support so it's only supporting with tax dollars uh, the 250 people that own those food cyclers so it's just something to think about um, the 250 to add or the food cyclers to add has intent which is to reduce to our landfill uh, supporting the filters is, is taking tax dollars and supporting just those 250 residents. So just to separate the two yep. issues, that's all. Okay, Councillor Koch. Well, I would actually say the filters do support the whole, because if people are stopping use of their machine and <laughs> throwing it in the landfill because it smells bad, perhaps that's, anyway, I think it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, frankly. Uh, and I would also support the $10,000. So I think we have great. Uh, yeah, so the resolution will change. Um, yeah. That's there now to yeah. incorporate the uh, support of the filters. Yeah, and I, I just want to confirm though that we, we, it's not actually where the taxpayer is subsidizing this because someone would come in here and purchase yeah, a filter not, or well, not pardon? from yeah not from us directly if yeah. we didn't support yeah. this yes yeah so it, I, I mean at some point now we're going to get our money back. On the on the inventory and not so mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. Okay, uh, you okay then? Yep, I'm good. I'll amend the resolution. Good. Uh, item number four, community services. Uh, no no reports. Item number five, development services. No reports. Uh, proclamations. Uh, I actually have one. Alzheimer's Awareness Month, and uh, we had the opportunity to. Um, be part of a flag raising uh, about a week, uh, week, week and a bit ago, week and a half ago. Um, so the flag is up uh, flying in uh, front of City Hall for the month of January. Uh, proclamation, by virtue of authority vested in me, I hereby proclaim January 2023 as Alzheimer's Awareness Month in and for the City of Kenora and request its observance as such by our citizens Proclaimed at the City of Kenora this 11th day of January 2023, His Worship 
uh, Mayor Andrew Poirier. Uh, next meeting, uh, so now we're on the Wednesday circuit and we'll, we'll try that and see how this works. Uh, it'll be Wednesday, February 8th, uh, 2023. Um, there's a motion to adjourn to close meeting. Uh, can I have that read, please? Thank you, Your Worship. I move this motion, uh, this resolution, seconded by Councillor Van Bellingham, that pursuant to Section 239 of the Municipal Act 2001, as amended authorization is hereby given to committee to move into a closed session at 11:08 a.m. to discuss items pertaining to the following: uh, Item one, education and training members of council; number two, labor relations; number three, personal matter about an identifiable individual; and number four, disposition of land. Thank you. Uh, call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Um, can we have
just have to ask for uh, any any reports. Yes, anything. so we're good. Okay. So we are back. Okay, uh, well, welcome back to the public session. Um, so uh, we're just looking for any any reports uh, that have to become public. So there should be uh, from the closed session. Yes. Yeah. So there should be. Is there another motion? Or? Just one report, yeah. uh, and Councillor Koch will report on that uh, okay. report. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. A report coming out of our closed session today is to appoint two members to the Accessibility Advisory Committee, Heather Bird and Corey Newfield. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, that's it. And We're adjourned at 2.52. Oh, We're on time. No, actually, it's early today. <laughs>